Hey, welcome to Three Con Commentary. This is your boy Mongo Slade, and today we're going to do a breakdown of the Iron Sheik's documentary called The Sheik. It was an incredible story that I really want to talk about, and I actually did some supplemental reading on this too. So it's not just me going off of what happened in the documentary. I'm actually going to bring in some other things. It's just some minor details that I thought were kind of important. So, um, we get into the Iron Sheik, who was originally from Iran. So he was born in 1942 in a small town outside of Tehran, Iran. He began wrestling at 14. He said he only cared about wrestling. And then we get some back, some uh, some geopolitics about the importance of sports in Iran. That uh, the physical training is the foundation of a healthy state and a healthy citizenship in a healthy state. This is the sort of thing that you see in warrior cultures all the time. And I know that I, I, it's probably somewhat improper to call Iran a warrior culture. But you see a lot of the warrior cultures, they really uh, force sports and physical training upon people. It's an old Roman thing, Greek thing. Uh, you see things in South South Africa. You see it in Japan. A lot of the regimented military type of training where you'll see like kids have to get together and do workouts. And, you know, it's really suggested that you do uh, physical training. And I think the United States might be one of the first countries that kind of get, went away from that. That, you know, you don't have kids in large groups expected to do sports anymore. You know, it's not mandated, you know. But it, it was back in those days. So uh, he said he his, his thing was wrestling. And he voluntarily went into the Army at 18. Uh, he was one of the top wrestlers in the Army. He became an Iranian national champion and won first place for two years. Then he said he became the bodyguard for the Shah, who was the king of Iran. And uh, this was before the Ayatollahs. So if you know anything about Iran right now, you know the Ayatollahs is a Muslim state. Doesn't mean that there weren't any Muslims in Iran at the time. It's just that the uh, the, the state the, was not controlled by the Islamists. Let's put it like that. They didn't control the government yet. Um, they would come to control the government because of the Shah. <laughs> you know, the Shah was... Um, he was a tyrannical leader, and he's also, to some people, refer to him as an American puppet. The uh, the Shah came into power in 1941. He always favored athletes. He, he enjoyed athletes, so therefore he liked wrestlers. Um, he so he liked uh, uh, the Iron Sheik, and he also liked this gentleman named uh, oh, his first name is um, uh, is horrible. His last name is Takti, and Takti was a national hero. Takti won the gold medal. In uh, freestyle wrestling, uh, light heavyweight division in 1956. So this is an Olympic gold medalist. Uh, and uh, he was one of the, another one of the bodyguards with the Shah and was one of the best friends of the Iron Sheik when he was a, a young, a young lad in Iran. And that he was, a uh, he was, and Iron Sheik said that he was a role model, that he was the best wrestler in the history of the country, period. And that, you know, uh, the Shah, um, after, I believe after he won the gold medal, no, actually probably not after he won the gold medal, because this was, um, it was after he had won something, Takti, and went to see the Shah. And the Shah offered him money. He said, what do you want? Money, women, houses, or whatever. And Takti told him to reinvest into in the the people, the schools, the hospitals, um, different things like that. And apparently this offended the Shah, according to the Iron Sheik, um, Khazro Vaziri, um, which is his real name. He says that this pissed off the Shah. And then one day, of course, uh, Takti was found dead in a hotel room. And uh, the government, the official government statement is that Takti committed suicide. He was 37 years old. But um, a lot of there was a lot of conspiracies that he had, you know, of course, had gotten into some arguments with the Shah and then turned up dead. So they said, okay, this isn't suicide. This was murder, right? So there's a lot of people who believe that Takti was murdered by the Shah. And, uh, you know, uh, because Takti was his role model and that since Takti, of course, uh, liked wrestlers, but um, was willing to kill him, you know, in his mind, Iron Sheik said, hey, they'll kill Takti, who was a national hero, then they'll kill me. So he took off and went to live in New York. So he didn't know any English when he moved to New York and he was only in New York a week before he moved to Minnesota 
where he became an assistant coach to the Olympic team um, in international freestyle Greco-Roman wrestling. And uh, he won four AAU championships in that in his tenure as a coach. Um, he met his wife in 1971 at the University of Minnesota, where he was coaching. And then in 1973, he began training in pro wrestling under Vern Gagne. Um, Vern Gagne in the AWA is quite the hell of a story. You know, the AWA was the first promotion to leave the NWA. And it was over Vern Gagne and his beef with Luthez. Um, this was also has something to do with, I believe, Fred Kohler out of Chicago, where Fred Kohler gave, uh, I believe it was Fred Kohler gave Vern Gagne this belt, this United States championship. And Luthez thought that the United States championship was a second world title. And he that, that became a big brouhaha about that because Luthez was like, the, the whole point of the NWA is there can only be one world champion. Um, any, anyway, they, they ended up breaking that up and, you know, Luthez got his way and it was only one world title and it was pretty much told that the United States championship was not a world title, but then Vern Gagne couldn't get a match with Luthez and because he couldn't get a match with Luthez, he got together with some other people and he just decided to break out and he went up to Minneapolis and started his own promotion, which was American Wrestling Association. So this is where, uh, the, um, the Iron Sheik uh, trained. He trained with Ric Flair, Jim Brunzel, and Greg Gagne. And they talked about how tough the uh, the training was for Vern Gagne because Vern Gagne was a, a shooter. It was a, it was a legit, um, had a legit background in wrestling. He would often try and try to run people off. Uh, the story of how bad Greg Gagne, not Greg Gagne, but Vern Gagne's training is, is notorious. They're, they talked about it extensively. Like if you watch like the Ric Flair documentaries or something like that, you see how bad it was. Like you see pictures of what Ric Flair looked like when he started those trainings and then what he looked like afterwards. I mean, he really, he really got Ric Flair in shape. <laughs> like he really taught him up. Anyway, this is where he learned the business. After he survived the uh, monstrous training of uh, Vern Gagne, this is where he became, uh, he started getting smartened up to the business. But Sheik had a bad reputation. Now, you know, he was a legitimate wrestler and he could do whatever he wanted to people. And because he didn't really understand, maybe it was a language barrier or something like that, he had a reputation for hurting people. And so he couldn't really, he couldn't get any matches. And uh, because he had a bad reputation, he basically ended up working on the ring crew. Basically, he drove the truck and was basically a referee. Um, all During this time, he was wrestling under his real name. And... Uh, so things started to change um, after in 1976, I believe it was. Um, this is when the Iron Sheik was born. Um, Khazro Vaziri is, again, once again, an assistant coach of, of the uh, wrestling Olympic team. Mary Ganya, Vern Ganya's wife, uh, makes a suggestion. She says, hey, you know, you're really Middle Eastern. Maybe you should call yourself a Sheik. And... Uh, Vaziri remembers like, oh, yeah, I used to see, you know, the Arabs all the time. This is where I should mention that um, Iranians are not Arabs. They're Persians. Um, it's in, it's Indo-Aryan, I believe it's called. Uh, it's, they're Indo-Aryans. They're not Arabs. So they're not like uh, Palestinians or Egyptians or Moroccans or Libyans or anything like that. They're their own separate thing. So, um he remembers seeing a lot of Arabs in Iran, though. Um, so he remembers how the Iranians, I mean, how the Arabs looked. And he spoke Farsi, so he, ha he had the language barrier. He had the language thing. And he just had to get the look. So he shaved his head and grew out a mustache with his wife said she hated both of those things. And by 1977, he had completely changed himself from uh, the original Khazro Vaziri to the Iron Sheik. So Jen, Jake Roberts popped up in this thing and says that, you know, whatever is going on in the world is magnified a hundred times in wrestling, which is very, very true. Um, you can just think of so many storylines that, uh, especially WWE has gotten into where it's an extension of reality. And this is basically, you know, they're fantastic extensions of reality. I just think about the Jack Swagger, Dutch Mantel, uh, illegal immigration storyline. Um, we, the people. That is just a magnified version of what they were doing on TV all the time. But, you know, that's a really great thing. 
So basically, they start talking about the Iranian uh, hostage crisis that um, that uh, that we the country was involved in. The seven I don't know how was it how many I don't remember how many days it was, but President Carter basically let the Iranians hold Americans hostage in the embassy for several several days, and that really uh, frustrated a lot of people. And from this, you started seeing a lot of promoters really want. Uh, foreign Iranian characters in order to draw heat. And since the Iron Sheik was a real Iranian, he was really able to draw a lot of heat by doing anti-American stuff and playing the foreign menace. And this is where his career really takes off because he is sort of a middling uh, performer up to that point is that he really didn't have any, um, he really didn't have any success before he was the Iron Sheik. And then he became the Iron Sheik and it, it became successful. And then, when the Iranian hostage crisis happened, it was wildly successful. So Mick Foley shows up and he's talking about there's two kinds of heat. There's good heat and there's bad heat. The good heat is that when people are booing you. The bad heat is when people are trying to kill you. And he said the Sheik had both. And then Sheik talks about I have more heat than any human being. <laughs> Which I believe. I believe. They show some clips of him hanging out in these... Uh, Autograph signings. These were very nice clips from him hanging out with like Larry Zabisco and Coco Beware and Bret Hart and Ron Simmons and Slick and basically all the old guys from the 80s and early 90s. And Sonny was there too. Um, Jimmy Hart told some story, told a story about uh, people in Memphis who were going to try to shoot him in the Sheik. And it was, that was, that was crazy. That was crazy. So he for his first run to New York, um, was was with uh, teaming with Nikolai Volkov, and they did the the anti-American tag team, and he said that you know there was so much heat for the Sheik that they were scared that he was going to get shot, so they he would need a ride to the hotel. They didn't trust him to walk to his car because he might get attacked. So what they would do is sometimes they would do ambulance angles, and they would take him to his hot, his uh, hotel room in an ambulance, or they would have cars come and pick him up. And, uh, he, uh, that was crazy. That's, that's crazy. Um, so I'm gonna skip his, um, they talked about his family, but I'm gonna talk about his family in one big group. We're gonna talk about that near the end after we talk about his wrestling career. So in the WWF, apparently, according to a Yahoo article, he was making $500,000 a year in the WWF in the early nineties when this man wanted to go national. Um, he, of course, brought in all these celebrities to endorse the WWF. And this is where he brings in Hulk Hogan. In 1983, about Christmas 1983, the Iron Sheik wins the WWF title from Bob Backlund. Bob Backlund had been WWF champion since 1978. Uh, he were, he Bob Backlund refused to do the job for Hogan. Hogan was not an amateur wrestler. He had no amateur background to speak of. But the Sheik did, and he had an extensive amateur background, had won all these um, gold medals and all of these championships. So it, he believed that it was believable that he, the Iron Sheik could beat him. And so Bob Backlund agreed to be to drop the title to the Iron Sheik with the Iron Sheik dropping the title to Hulk Hogan. Now, if you've never seen Bob Backlund versus the Iron Sheik, it is horrible. Legit. It is a terrible match. Like it is, it is really bad. Um, I think Iron Sheik was in his forties when this match happened. Um, I, 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 I probably would. Well, this was nineteen seventy three. No, nineteen eighty three. He was born in nineteen forty two, so he was forty one when this match happened. Forty one or forty two? I don't remember what his birthday is. But he he was born in nineteen forty two, and this match was happening in nineteen eighty three. So yeah, he'd been forty one. Um, Iron Sheik was not good he was not good um anyway he won the wwf championship in madison square garden and then dropped the belt to hogan just a month or so later and this was of course the birth of hulkamania and um uh, it's pretty you know he's one of the many people who say without me there is no hulkamania you know Roddy piper also said that <laughs> so you know there's a lot of guys who said you know you know there is no without me there's no hulkamania you know, no Sheik, no, no Iron Sheik, no Hulkamania. And uh, Hulk Hogan has, of course, said it, but, you know, Hulk Hogan says a lot of things a lot of times. He doesn't really, he doesn't believe half of what he says. And the other half is, is 
obvious lies. So then we tell the story that the Iron Sheik was offered $100,000 to break Hulk Hogan's leg and bring the title back to Minnesota. This is from Varangania. And, uh, you know, Roberts basically says that, you know, the style of the WWF was to basically just feed guys to Hogan and that you get one run with Hogan and that's pretty much it. That after you get your run with Hogan, you never really get back to that spot. And so he says, like, maybe Sheik should have broken his leg. And I don't think, like, Jake Snake Roberts have a problem. Like, he's really, like, he's a, he's demented, you know? Like, he's talking about, like, you know, sometimes the bad guy's got to go over and not like heat. Like, that's not the right kind of heat. Like, you want to double cross this guy who's paying you all this money and, you know, you're going to double cross him? Robert, it's no wonder you end up fucking broke. <laughs> you fucking maniac. Anyway, uh, Sheiky Baby, of course, um, was a man of his word and did the job as he was asked to do. Um, and he didn't break Hulk Hogan's leg, even though he did become, you know, a fuck Hulk Hogan guy later. Um, he, he did not break Hulk Hogan's leg. Uh, but it's interesting that Vern Gagne offered it. Obviously, the reason for this, for the younger listeners who may be listening to this and you don't know why, um, Hulk Hogan got his big break in Minneapolis. That was the point of me telling you the story about the birth of the AWA. Uh, Hulk Hogan had worked in the WWF for Vincent J. McMahon, the father of Vincent K. McMahon. Vincent J. McMahon didn't want Hulk Hogan to do Rocky. He, for some reason, didn't want him to do Rocky. I think he just kind of had this old school mentality that it wasn't, you know, you're going to be an actor or you're going to be a wrestler. You can't be both. Right. And I'm guessing if I was to venture a guess, the reason why that would be is people would think that the actor is wrestling and that would make the business look fake. Right. But, um, you know, he just didn't have the foresight, obviously. But um, so Hogan forsaked the WWF thinking he'll never work there again. He went and did Rocky, became more popular than ever. And the only place that could really book him was Minneapolis. And he was a superstar up there. Um, but Vern Gagne, again, was much like, um, you know, Luthez and all those other old timers. You don't have an amateur background. Therefore, you cannot be world champion. So Hulk Hogan was the biggest draw in the territory, but was routinely getting screwed out of the title by, I'm pretty sure, Vern, uh, Bachwinkle was in his late 40s at this point, maybe even 50, um, when he was at the top of the cards at this point. But they kept booking Hogan and Bachwinkle and the chase where they kept doing things where Hogan would win the title, but then they'd overturn the decision. Uh, he took him over the top rope or something like that. And they would keep taking the belt away, keep taking the belt away. And they keep teasing and taking, teasing and taking. Now, according to Hulk Hogan, uh, his, uh, that wasn't the problem. The problem wasn't that he, would, he wouldn't get the belt. The problem was that he was going back and forth to Japan and then Vern Gagne wanted a piece of that money. That he wanted a piece of what Hogan was doing in Japan and what Hogan was doing in merchandise. Because this was when merch Hogan was like one of the really first guys to really do merchandise. Um, and really do it on a major scale. According to him, anyway. And uh, Vern Gagne wanted a piece of that money and a piece of the money of what Hogan was doing in Japan. And Hogan was like, no, I'm not giving you anything. You know, this is mine. And um, his issues with Vern Gagne, of course, the creative... Thing was one thing, but when he started encroaching in on his money, he was it was a completely different thing. And, I, and even some stories of uh, Vern Gagne maybe just taking money from Hogan without asking. Now, I don't know if, if that's true or not, but um, that's kind of been one of the things that's been talked about is that Vern Gagne basically was uh, shaving from the top when it comes to the Hulk Hogan thing. And so Hogan basically decided to uh, leave, that he was going to bounce and that's when he jumped to the WWF to win the title from the Iron Sheik. So that's why uh, Vern Gagne wanted Hulk Hogan's legs broken, you know, because he figured, you know, Hogan did also renege on a lot of uh, uh, things that he was supposed to do. He's supposed to do a lot of uh, promos and he had some matches and stuff and stuff like that. He's supposed to do. And Vince basically paid him more money to say, fuck Vern Gagne that I'm paying you not to go up there. And, Hogan apparently told them this, told the Ganyas that, you know, I'm being paid not to go do your promos and not work these matches, even though I'm contracted to do them. 
he basically decided not to do them. And so he really left with a lot of bad blood and a lot of heat in Minneapolis. And so when he left, uh, Vern Gagne was like, look, fuck this guy. You know, there's also when Vern Gagne decided to try to run in New York and all that type of stuff. It didn't work out. Anyway, there was a lot of heat with the AWA, a lot of heat. But uh, Sheik was like, OK, look, they ain't got nothing to do with me. <laughs> right. Um, but that takes some balls because Sheik's this is Sheik's trainer. And it's somebody he respects in Vern Gagne who's asking him to do this and was going to pay him and take care of him. But, you know, Vince was already taking care of him. Apparently, if he's making 500 grand a year, I'm about to break a guy's leg for 100. You know, that's nuts. Anyway, um, so the downfall of the Iron Sheik in the WWF, of course, led, uh, came from his arrest with Hacksaw Jim Duggan in, uh, by the Jersey State Troopers in the 1980s, in the late 1980s. Uh, Hulk Hogan, not Hulk Hogan, Hacksaw Jim Duggan um, says that he was approached by Iron Sheik who had lost his credit card or didn't have a credit card. And he asked him to give him a ride to the to the hotel, give him a ride to the arena or something. And of course, that during this time, kayfabe is in full effect. The baby faces and the heels are not supposed to be seen together. And the Iron Sheik and Hacksaw Jim Duggan are actually supposed to be wrestling against each other that night. So they get into the car. Sheik stops Duggan to get some beer. You know, he goes in there, he gets the beer, he comes back. Duggan is new to the territory. He had been working in Mid-South, I believe. And I forget what else he was doing. But uh, he was new to the territory. So he's basically just doing what the, what, the, what the elder is telling him to do. And he's stopping to get the beer. Uh, Sheik is pounding beers. And then he said the first time he drinks a beer, the Jersey State Trooper pulls him over. Um, they get arrested. Uh, DUI, both of them. They get taken down to the station. They get handcuffed together. They get searched. Uh, Duggan is clean, but Sheik has cocaine. And uh, they get bonded out. And they get arrested at about 6 o'clock and the show was at 8. So within two hours, they got searched and bonded out. And then uh, they worked the match. And then they didn't say anything. They never told anybody they had gotten arrested. And then the next night, well, the next, later that night, Duggan said he called his wife and told her that she had gotten arrested. And, um, and he said the next morning, she called him back and said, basically, it's in the newspaper. That, you know, Hacksaw Jim Duggan and the Iron Sheet got caught together uh, with a DUI and Vince McMahon fired both of them, which was probably the right thing to do at the time. Probably the right thing to do. I don't know. Uh, so <laughs> I don't know. You know, it depends on what your feelings are on that type of stuff. You know, firing guys for breaking kayfabe. You know, a lot of a lot of promoters would have done that without a problem. You know, they would have fired them guys without a without a second thought. But um, that was, the, you know, they kind of skipped that the Iron Sheet kind of went other places. But they basically said, you know, he he was getting older at this point. You know, the Iron Sheet is probably like the late 80s. So if he was in the early 80s, he was in his 40s. So the late 80s, he's probably in his mid 40s. And um, he just wasn't the performer that he had used to be. He could barely move. Injuries had stacked up. So now he's basically working the independence. And people were talking about how, you know, he was embarrassed after being fired and he was embarrassed to work these um, the independents because he was used to working in big arenas for the WWF. And now he's back working in high school gyms, doing jobs and small shows. It was absolutely disgusting. And this is where he made the, the, uh, the Majin brothers, the Megan brothers. Um, these are two guys who are friends of the Iron Sheik's uh of, of a friend, they not they were the sons of the Iron Sheik's friend. Basically, the Iron Sheik had so there were some other Iranians who were living in the United States who saw the Iron Sheik on TV, and uh, the boys have been watching wrestling, of course, like kids tend to do, and they saw the Iron Sheik, and they reckon you know, and the mother, their mother recognized uh, the Iron Sheik, and they he reconnected with his friend. And now these guys are older and they see that the Iron Sheik is working independent shows and, you know, for hot dogs and a, and a handshake. And they try to basically befriend him. You know, they try to remind him of who he used to be. 
So this is where we kind of get into the whole, um, with him talking about his drug problems and the drug problems come from his family. So we're going to talk about his family a little bit. I have to find the paper. Where is his, the thing on his family? He's got, well, he, again, I say he married, he married, uh, his wife in the 1970s, but they had three daughters. I don't have the, I don't write, I didn't write their names down. But um, obviously the daughters, because he wrestled so much and he traveled so much, they didn't see him that much, that often. But um, he says that they didn't really know anything about wrestling. They weren't really into it. They were, they were really girly girls with the exception of Marissa. Now Marissa is, <clears throat> Marissa is an important one because Marissa got murdered and she was strangled by a boyfriend when she was 20, when she was 27 and Two, what, what, what it was May the 23rd no May the 3rd 2003 she was strangled by um, a boyfriend and this led uh, this increased his already existing drug problem that um, Marissa was the one girl out of all of them that actually wanted to be a wrestler and that he was training to be a wrestler but um, she was murdered and this of course compounded his drug issue and you see that there's a lot of quite a few clips in this documentary of you know, the Iron Sheik talking about he wants to go get his medicine. That there's a lot of clips in here of him spazzing out on people. Like obviously I on something. Him smoking hookah. Um you don't see him actually doing drugs with the exception of smoking hookah and maybe smoking weed. So it's not like you're seeing him with a needle in his arm or, you know, cooking crack on a spoon or something like that, but they're doing a lot of talking about, you know, how he needs to clean up his act. But um, it was clear that he was out of control and that his wife was getting frustrated with him. And, uh, you know, so he became uncontrollable. This is where he get the we get some great quotes. You know, the, the, the some of the most fantastic quotes in the movie was when the sheik was fucked up. Like he was in the hookah bar. And, and this guy, one of the Megan brothers was talking to him and he says, you know, do you understand where I'm coming from? And Sheik was like, I don't give a fuck where you come from. Don't you ever insult the legend. He was talking about the guy that he was with was, was the legend. <laughs> don't you ever insult the legend. <laughs> so, uh, Carol Viziri, his wife was talking about how he just half existing. That, you know, he was, uh, he was an alcoholic who had, you know, he had beaten the alcoholism, but he started smoking crack and was doing cocaine and was uh, smoking weed. Um, you could see physically that he was a mess. He walks with a cane, but his ankle was so busted. Like his ankle was so twisted. It was like he was walking on it. Like it was disturbing. Like they made sure to get the, the camera on it. Cause the camera was like, boom, right on it. And you could see his ankle was swollen and he's basically walking on his ankle. And they said to support his habit, he would wear his gold medals. He would wear his awards. He would wear like a championship belt, like the world heavyweight title, the WWE world heavyweight title, what they call the big gold belt. He would walk around with it and wait for people to recognize him. And then if they did, he would sell them a picture in order to, you know, get the money for his drugs. So he would go into public places and basically solicit. And, you know, he wouldn't go out there and panhandle, but he would wait for people to recognize him. And then he would charge them for pictures. And it was, it was, it was incredibly sad. It was incredibly sad. It was incredibly sad. And a lot of the stuff in his house was, was really sad too. Like he confronted, got confronted with his wife and his wife asked him like, Hey, are you going to pray to God to, to, to get, to get off all the drugs? And he was like, you care about my body more than me. You care about my heart and my body more than me. And I was like, wow. Can you imagine saying that to somebody? Like, I can't, like, I don't believe you care more about my body than I do. Like, damn. But this was an even better answer to him. Where she's uh, she's continuing like you know, a simple yes or no would suffice, and he says, "I'm 65. I'm a legend. I'm a coach. I'm the best." Now you telling me I'm a bad trainer? I'm a bad coach? I'm a bad champion? Don't insult me. Have a good day. <laughs> she was stupefied, bro. <laughs> she was stupefied at that answer. 
And because cocaine is an upper, you know, it make you feel, it gives you, a, a, you know, an inflated sense of ego and inflated sense of attitude. So in his mind, he's still everything he used to be. He's still the greatest coach, still the greatest wrestler, still the world champion. That's why he has to carry around the belt so he can take pictures with it and stuff. He's still the world champion. He's still the legend. He's still the Hall of Famer. He's still everything. You know, he's not an old beat up crackhead. You know, he's still the legend. And basically he's saying, like, I'm the legend. And he was arguing with one of the Megan brothers. He says that too. He says, like, who's the legend? You or me? Like, you, are you in my body? How do you know what to do with my body? You know, like, you know, these medicines, they exist. I want to have a good time with them. And it was... That was that was a brutal line, man. When he says, "Are right, who's the legend? You or me?" <laughs> I love that line. That's a great line. Who's the legend? You or me? God damn it! So uh, they they did a big skip, a big time skip to when uh, they were begging him to get clean, um, and they skipped a lot of that to talk about basically when he started getting clean and when he, he had lost his family. So basically what happened in from the uh, Yahoo article that I found is that the Iron Sheet got arrested in 2005 for uh, busted for possession of cocaine and marijuana, two counts of cocaine, one count of marijuana. Um, this was the straw that broke the camel's back and his wife left him. Um, so uh, apparently, well, he got put out of the house. He was living in an apartment not far from his daughter and he decided to get clean. And so he did and he got clean and, you know, he was still trying to get back, you know, in the good graces of the family. And, uh, he had given up the crack and all the type of stuff. And, you know, the value, it just shows the value of his family to him. And then we started going into the, the social media and internet sensation that the iron sheet began when, uh, and they say they be, it began when the Iron Sheik was asked to do a, a response video that Michael Richards had done uh, the the nigger joke when he taught some black people niggers and you know uh, Kramer from Seinfeld. And basically, these guys basically set it up so that Iron Sheik could watch something and then respond to it. And then this is where he did the famous "I'll fuck you in the ass and make you humble" and put it up on YouTube. And then, of course, it became viral. So they started recording Iron Sheik doing all sort of crazy stuff, yelling at people. And Carol was talking about how she felt like it was embarrassing, that it was sort of, um, she thought they were making fun of him. And it, she felt like it was embarrassing to her, too. But ultimately, you know, it gave him a, a different set of notoriety. It made him famous again. Because... Um, you know, on Twitter and on YouTube and stuff like that, he became like a superstar. Excuse me. And he, you know, he ended up on Howard Stern when he was arguing with some guy who called himself the Iron Sheik Jr. It was obviously just some Howard Stern joke that he didn't really catch on to. Howard Stern obviously making fun of him. And this, of course, when, you know, the Iron Sheik became like a cultural icon for yelling on Twitter about fuck Hulk Hogan and fuck the Los Angeles Lakers or whatever, and how much I love Kobe Bryant, Bubba. But um, you you have all of this, um, all of these people who are helping him. The Megan brothers are putting up the money for the documentary. They're you know crowdfunding the money for the documentary. They're the ones who run the YouTube channel. They run the Twitter account as well. And basically, he said the Twitter account is basically things that the Iron Sheik has said. That um that they distill down to 140 qu- characters and try to deliver it in a way that he uh, would deliver it, so they don't editorialize and they don't make up things. He they, they those are his real reactions. And apparently Terry Funk has a Twitter account where it's similar, where somebody younger is running the account and they just tweet out things that Terry Funk is thinking. So basically, this led to you know him talking about fucking people in the ass and making them humble. Led to movie cameos his massive Twitter account and, uh, you know, him being allowed to go to the Twitter conferences where he dropped his original fuck Hulk Hogan, uh, promo. Um, you know, he's about fucking him in the ass and making him humble. Him being on robot chicken 
and all the other things that led to the Iron Sheik sort of um, finding some level of cultural relevance since his wrestling career ended. And this is pretty much where it ends, is that the Iron Sheik is doing better now. He's in a better place. He's doing, um, he's kind of come to grips with, you know, he's kind of succeeded and it was over all of the drugs and alcohol and different things like that that was holding him down. And this documentary was really revealing. Uh, and it didn't feel stagey. It felt like part episode of Intervention, part wrestling documentary. They didn't utilize a lot of WWF footage. In fact, they didn't utilize much of any. They used some still pictures. Apparently, WWF didn't have anything to do with this. Um, so there wasn't any WWF logos. They talked about it a lot, but there was not a lot of... Uh, there was. They didn't show you... Uh, video or anything like that the rock was in this obviously him and the rock have a really close relationship because he was one of the rock's mentors and the rock you know talked glowingly about the iron sheik and about the iron sheik um his wife was the rock's babysitter that she used to look after him when his dad was wrestling and um he talked about the rock uh, the rock talked about you know the jabroni that iron sheik is the one who came up with the jabroni and that was like a, it's like, that was like a wonderful thing that, you know, the Iron Sheik took the rock under his wing because the Iron Sheik was there. Uh, I believe he was, he was Colonel Mustafa and I believe, he, and I think, I think that was in the nineties. I don't think he was, a I don't think he was involved with the Sultan. At least if he was, I probably don't remember it that clearly, clearly enough to talk about it and articulate on it, but I'm pretty sure he worked with the rock in the nineties. Um, and for, for some reason, cause I know the rock had an extensive thing with the Sultan. And I think that the iron Sheik was involved with that. The Sultan was just Rikishi in a mask and, uh, up pointed boots, which is really dumb, <laughs> but I don't know if he was going by the iron Sheik or if he was going by Colonel Mustafa. I don't know. Cause they, you know, they used to bring back guys and just change their names. Like they do that with Dutch Mantel and different stuff like that. That stuff gets kind of confusing. And then like, the a lot of the small bits of the early '90s, I don't remember that much. But the you know, the uh, the Iron Sheik worked with the Rock, and was actually helped the Rock, you know, um, how, help him come along in the wrestling business, and gave him advice, and spent a lot of time with him. And you could see they showed clips of him uh, teaching other guys, you know, basic wrestling, you know, um, takedowns, and you know, giving guys advice and stuff like that. You know, even with his cane. And it was, it was pretty cool. Like you got to see the Sheik in his uh, natural habitat doing training, you know, tra training the next generation, which is something that he was really good at and something that he had been doing before he was even a pro wrestler. So that was great. You know, um, it was sad to see him on the drugs and to see him acting out the way that he was. Of course, it was nothing like he was starting, you know, fights and stuff like that it was just basically him verbally abusing people um you know <laughs> and being dismissive and but sometimes but you know they say you know when you're dealing with an addict you're not talking to the person you're talking to their addiction it's basically the drugs talking it's like they're being possessed by a demon or some type of otherworldly creature and having known some people who are you know addicts i can say that there is some truth to that you know, um, it's, it's the same thing when you're talking with, to people who have depression or people who have uh, bipolar disorder. Sometimes you're not talking to them. You're talking to their their problem, their issue. And it's unfortunate, but that's just kind of the, how it is. But it was really sweet that The Rock, you know, who never really takes time to do much of anything, took time to be in this documentary and was probably, you know, one of the big selling points for being in it. And it was amazing. It was actually pretty fucking good. This documentary was really touching. Um, and I liked it. I like to see that the Sheik has, you know, pulled out of it. You know, he was one of the, I love seeing these documentaries because it's like, the, it's always going to be a rise and fall. There's always going to be a, a time when a guy is down and a time when the guy is back up. And I enjoy seeing when they get back up. I enjoy seeing these guys kick out, man. There's nothing more depressing than some of these documentaries, like the Brian Pillman documentary or the, uh, the Mr. Perfect documentary or something like that, where you know, the, the Yokozuna icons documentary where you see these guys and they can't kick out, you know, there's nothing more disturbing like than that. 
and you see like these guys have so much potential or they had done so much have been so uh, influential. And then all of a sudden they just get stuck in the drugs and the alcohol or, you know, something. They just can't get away from it. But the Iron Sheik, you know, you never insult the legend. The legend made it through. So I'm really, really glad to see it. It was a great documentary. So um, like this video, share this video, subscribe to the channel. Thank you guys for your time. Uh, send money via Cash App in the, con in the comment section below. And utilize the hashtag 3 count commentaries to keep the channel growing and to bring attention to the channel. I'm trying to do my best here. But um, thank you guys for your time and I'll talk to you guys later, man. Peace.